Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of Women of Arabia. Women of Arabia is a platform where we showcase the best women entrepreneurs and women across all fields of life in Arabia who with their sheer determination, their hard work and passion, they have carved a niche and created their dreams into reality. conversation with us is the founder and CEO of Mina Speakers, Sana Azad. <laughs> Thank Welcome you for having me. Welcome to Women of Arabia, Sana. Thank you. Being someone from the public speaking or emceeing background, obviously, uh, everyone in UAE, almost on the Gulf region, know what Mina Speakers is all about. The oh. Mina region know what Mina Speakers <laughs> is all about. But just for the very few who don't really sure. know, what exactly is Mina Speakers? Sure. So, Mina Speakers is the leading speakers bureau in the region. We represent over 200 experts, top talents, presenters, speakers mm -hmm. that go out to conferences and do, you know, share knowledge with their audiences. Okay. Yeah. So to give you an example, we have speakers that cover economics, you know, and motivational speakers, leadership speakers, and they go and educate, engage and empower their audiences. Wow. Yeah. And what, what actually, you know, compelled you or what was the whole reason behind MENA speakers and the birth of MENA speakers? So if we can just go back, have you always sure. been into public speaking and have you been a very, <laughs> what do you say, very uh, outgoing child, <laughs> have you? Um, I, I wouldn't say so. So I'm the youngest child of eight. Being the youngest child of eight, uh, you have to speak up to be heard. So this is for sure or else you won't get fed. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> but you won't be noticed. Uh, you won't get, so you really need to claim your space mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is kind of where it started. Girls, boys? Mixed, mixed. a healthy mix. So uh, three boys, five girls. Okay. Yeah, and then mom and dad. So we're 10, we're almost a football team. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so that that in itself is where you really learn how to speak up and kind of claim your space. Right. Um, I think very few people are kind of born saying, I want to be a speaker. Right. You know, you have, you have some that can claim they want to be lawyers. My brother wanted to be a doctor early on in life. Okay. My sister wanted to be a lawyer very early on in life. Mm -hmm. And I was just very not clear on what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to do something fun where I could travel, uh, where I could be financially independent mm -hmm. and uh, something with an impact. Mm -hmm. So that took me on a bit of a journey. So I studied economics okay. oh. and I have a master's in economics. So which, you grew up in, where did you grow up in? In Sweden. In Sweden. <laughs> speak the language very well. Yeah. So it's a big Arab family in Sweden. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's where you started and you studied. And did you, because many times I am a mother of a teenager and I know that as we grow up, like you said, few, very few of them know exactly what they want and their vision mm -hmm. to be. But most of us, we just waddle through life, right? We just don't know exactly what we want yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah. So how did you find your passion into this? Great. And I think this is an incredibly important message here. You, mm -hmm. you don't have to know exactly what you want to be. Um, I knew that I wanted to do something that I enjoyed and I really tried on several different jobs. Like I worked at Nike for a while, um, I worked for American Express, I worked within banking, retail. So it's been a whole mix of different things mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what I like and what I didn't like as much. Mm -hmm. And that kind of put me on this path and by doing that, you start early on kind of finding your own voice and your passion. and and what path you want to be on. And what was interesting was that regardless of where I was working, I would always be pulled on stage. <laughs> and so I'd be the junior person in an organization. And uh, you know, my managers at the time would be like, well, you go and speak. I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't want to. No, you go. I'm like, okay, I can do it. <laughs> so I've been on stage quite a lot throughout my whole career talking about well, different things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of been in the works for a while, mm -hmm. but was really like a defining moment was when uh, in 2010, I won an award okay. that female economist of the year. Yes. Um, I got press coverage because of that. And was then it here or back home? this was in Sweden oh. All right. and uh, got a lot of press coverage and in that loop. Um, I got invited to speak 
-hmm. and this is really what it where it came to me okay. i wasn't necessarily pursuing but it did come to me and i kind of saw the opportunity and ran with it okay. but it resonated with me as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. so there are other opportunities that presented themselves for me okay. to work in other places but they weren't resonating with me mm -hmm. so i didn't pursue that right. and i think this is one of the ways in which you find your passion and what you enjoy you just kind of you're dr you know you're drawn to it you're drawn to it and yeah. it doesn't really matter what at what age what point of your career you are in because if you can if you have the luxury to go ahead and jump ahead sure. i think that's the best thing to do right sure 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 i mean we're going to be reinventing ourselves yeah. all the time especially with technology that's yeah. coming mm -hmm. you have to be incredibly agile we don't know what jobs await for the future right. yeah and so did you come to uae with this vision or what made you come to uae how long back was that? <laughs> this was about eight years ago. Okay. So I, uh, I was working as a professional speaker prior, actually. Oh, okay. For about a year, I was touring Northern Europe speaking. Mm. But as the typical overachiever, <laughs> I was working little and I was making a, you know, a healthy amount of money. Mm. And it was coming easy. It was yeah. coming too easy. And that might sound, sound odd, but if you're used to working hard and then kind of earning. You just don't you feel guilty. Yeah, if, it didn't feel 100% right. Okay. So I said, I can't do this. It's too early for my career for me to be living this comfortably. I want to go through, I want to learn more. And so um, I got a job within gold. I was training gold here. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I did that uh, for a while. So I worked for a Swiss company, trading mm -hmm. physical bullion gold and then trading in financial markets. Mm -hmm. And then again, there. The passion just kept. Yeah. Oh, no, you kept getting on stage. Because, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She's the one who loves <laughs> <laughs> She's her in. Okay. Exactly. All right. And so. then you decided to just go ahead, stop fighting and start again. Exactly. Stop speaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you see once after, how long back was when you set up Mina Speakers? Three years ago. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And within the past three years, because you do represent a lot of speakers, like you said, motivational speakers, MCs, um, how do you see has the shift been, the interest in the market been for the speakers and events in general? Great. So if we look on the global arena, mm -hmm. the diversity of thought mm. most of the speaker agencies around the world they they're really representing or ma majorly representing uh white males oh okay. <laughs> i thought you were going to say one or two people no no no, no. <laughs> yeah so if we look at the demographics you will see a majority of the voices that are up on stage around the world that is the case mm. And uh, nothing wrong with that demographics. God bless them. <laughs> However, I think that there has to be a diversity of thought. And this was really my, my core mm -hmm. and root cause for doing all of this. Because mm -hmm. I would like to see more Arab speakers, more Asian speakers, males, females, all types of personalities up on stage sharing knowledge. Because knowledge doesn't belong to one type of demographic. It belongs to all of us. And so it's important for... People in the audience, for teenagers, for children to see that type of role models and to show them that you can also be a thought leader, you can also be an expert, you can be a person that shares knowledge on stage. Mm -hmm. True. Because even in the advertising advertisement world, the first preference is always the, the, the white male. Yeah. The, the voice, you don't even see them, that's what you want. And, it's, and has it been hard trying to break that mold here in the region when you tried? I think you know, <laughs> starting your own business in any capacity yeah. is hard. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work and making it successful is incredibly hard. The odds are not on your side. Yeah. If you read different studies, what are they saying? 80-90% of all startups fail between... 80-90% yeah, within the first for six months? Oh, I've heard three years, I've heard five years, yeah. so whatever that may be, um, but the odds are not in your favor, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. And so, no, it hasn't been easy. Yeah. <laughs> How do you power through? I, mean, I know because any business to start, it, it's really difficult. And there are times it's, it's easier to give up. Yeah? Yeah, it is. Yeah, the truth but, is that there are days where I have been crying 
and I'm wondering why I'm doing what I'm doing. Why put off this? Yeah, because you, you're trying to figure stuff out and things are not moving in your favor. And then you're looking at cash flow and things are a bit tight and, and all of that. And so, yeah, there have definitely been moments of, ex- I've been tested, let's put it this way. Mm-hmm. But I also am doing something that is so true to my core. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm of service for something so much greater than myself. Mm-hmm. And that makes it so much easier for me to wake up seven days a week and power through. Mm-hmm. And when I'm feeling not so great because of whatever that's happened, I think about the impact that we will have. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes I have to go back to some, I haven't, in, in my inbox, I have a bunch of emails that I received that are like thank you notes and all mm-hmm. of that. So I'll go back and I'll read those. And I'll be like, okay. This, this is why I'm doing this for. Yeah. This is why I'm hovering through, right? Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes you do feel like, why are we doing this, right? Yeah. Sometimes. Is it the inner voices or it's the outside voices, mainly? Well, entrepreneurship tests your whole skill set. <laughs> 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 and so especially if you're, you're a single entrepreneur. So I didn't have anybody with me in the beginning. And what was clear is because you need to be sales, marketing, accounting, finance, uh, whatever, driver, everything. And so things that I hadn't quite yet mastered, Mm -hmm. the flaws were very apparent where I needed to grow. Mm -hmm. And having the, so first you're faced with that. Because if you're in a corporate environment, there are other people that are going to be taking care of these domains. Mm -hmm. So first you have to face that music and be honest with yourself and say, you know what, I don't have the skill set, I need help. Mm-hmm. And then acquiring that knowledge and asking for help from people. And the beauty is I've, I've been so supported. Okay. I've received so much support from lawyers, accountants, okay. friends, sales, okay. you okay. name it. But it's facing <laughs> that first mm-hmm. reaction of, uh-oh. <laughs> exactly. And when you come to a new country, you've been here, what, eight years now? Yeah. yeah. And when you come, you've, you've established, you managed to establish a network of friends and support system before you... Sure, to jump yeah. Into, right? Plunge yeah. The whole thing. And do you think that's important as women? Because I was having this uh, interview the other day where my friend was telling me, interview, he was telling me that as women, we have a problem in asking for help. Mostly. We do have a problem. We, we're afraid to be judged. Yeah. And have you ever felt that, come across that at times? Like, I have a problem asking favors or help from people close to me. Can't do that. Ah, Strangers? No. Interesting. Wonderful that you mentioned this. So there is a lot of science around this, Mm -hmm. and there is research on how how to do it. And Mm -hmm. like I told you, I've kind of been, I've been incredibly interested in communication early on. So what actually triggered all of this that made me very interested in understanding the dynamics of humans and how to communicate effectively was actually when I was working at a bank. So one of my first part-time jobs as a student, um, I used to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning and uh, work for an equity trading desk. So I was only female, absolutely only female, (laughs) youngest, and the only non-Swedish person. Ah, okay. Right? And that was completely fine. I was welcome to the team to do the job, but I wasn't really getting recognized. You know, we all sit on these different biases, right? Uh, yeah. And so it became important for me to be noticed and not only recognized for the job I was doing, but also for the every person that I am. Exactly. That you are, so as okay. a colleague. Yeah. And so this is where I started trying to decipher mm. how do I build relationships? How do I build rapport? Yeah. How do I ask for help? Right. Yeah. And yeah. so it came from a very practical experimentation mm-hmm. to then moving on to researching this, studying this, understanding what yeah. actually happens. Mm-hmm. And so there's something called the Franklin effect from Benjamin Franklin. Okay. And when you ask people for help, mm-hmm. the psychological impact is actually that you're almost gifting them with, please give me your expert advice because I trust you. And so that person is more likely to help you in the future, in that moment and in the future. So it's net net a positive effect to actually ask for help, ask for advice. Okay. Yeah. You say that. <laughs> it's always difficult to break that board, right? Because you're so accustomed not to ask. And sure. And as a woman, again, like I said, I don't know if it could be the same for men too. I'm, I'm, I'm think I'm generalizing here by saying, I don't know. I, it, I, it could be the same for men too, but I think we take it a bit more to heart as okay. women. Have you felt that? 
you know, studies. That uh, I, do, I haven't read any studies that talk about women not being able to ask for help per se. Uh, for example, when they negotiate, if they start a negotiation, it will be perceived negatively. Oh, right. Yeah. So again, there are techniques to address all of these issues. Mm -hmm. You mentioned two things. Mm -hmm. One is asking friends for, and family for yes. help. Yeah. And you're right. It's a trickier dynamic. So an example of something you could say is remind them of something you've done to them before. Mm -hmm. So remember when I helped you with oh, dinner right. last week? Right. Well, I was wondering if you could help me okay. with my essay today okay. or whatever it may be. So doing that becomes almost like a quid pro quo situation, but reminding them there's been an energy exchange, it makes conversation easier, mm. right? And then when it comes to negotiation, let's say you're entering that space and you know there are biases, mm. and this yeah. is what we're talking yeah. about. There are biases in, in humans and we need to address that so that they don't stand in the way for this, yeah. moving forward. Yeah, it's for beautiful. Sure. So in a negotiation, you can go in and say, I recognize, and I'm sure you've also read the research, okay. that when a woman negotiates, mm -hmm. it's going to be perceived negatively. But you and I, we're better than this. <laughs> <laughs> so let us part that aside and let's have a mature conversation, mm -hmm. right? Right. So which manager is not going to, you yeah, know, acknowledge consider that? consider it and acknowledge it. Yeah, because yeah, right. yeah. you're talking about the elephant in the room and you're mm -hmm. talking about the biases and now you're kind of identifying it and you're saying it's here, let's put it here mm -hmm. and now let's discuss. Right. discuss. Yeah. And then when in your career, while you were working or, you know, being with Nina Speakers and heading it, have you ever come across situations where you've not been taken just, just for the same reason when you try to communicate and the other side just just because you're of the opposite gender, have you ever had any of those issues? Or, you know? Sure! <laughs> that, huh? Sure! <laughs> uh, anybody that tells you as a woman in, in their career who hasn't, uh, surely they, they have. They might have just not paid attention to it. Yes, living in their own bubble, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, absolutely, it's happened. And I've worked internationally, I've worked very much in male dominated sectors. Mm -hmm. And this is partly the reason why I developed strategies yeah. to address these biases. Um, and many times, my counterparty, whoever that may be, is not aware that they're doing what they're doing. Okay. Is yeah. not aware that they're minimizing. Is not aware that they're setting me aside. Is not aware. So all of these things. Sure. Yeah, it happened for sure. And from all the aspects that you do in Nina Speakers, yeah. like, what's the one which you're most passionate about? Is it coaching? Is it public speaking? Um, classes, of course, training, communication training. I love it all. <laughs> I love it all. Yeah, the one thing, what right. gives you maximum satisfaction at the end of the day? It's your baby, of course. Uh, yeah, I love it all and I've constructed it in a way, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing everything that I love. Yes. Right. Um, and this is the blessing of being a, a business owner. You decide on the strategies yeah. that call you. Mm -hmm. Now, the biggest euphoria and my biggest joy, it really comes from that moment when things shift, when things transform in an individual. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that happen when I'm coaching clients. And this is where I see the upfront and you know it. Yeah. Yeah. It just happened. Or on stage where the speaker said something and you kind of feel the goosebumps. Yeah, yeah, the aha moment, the goosebumps, the ripple effect, and you, you just you feel it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and people go, ah, oh, and I know something happened. <laughs> and those are the moments that are really you know, one of the core reasons to why we wake up every day and do what we're doing. And um, so far, you've had representations here in the UAE. Are you doing something similar outside UAE? Uh, you are. Oh, right? yes. Uh, exactly. Where exactly are you being uh, spread with your wings to? Right. So we represent speakers from the whole Middle East, MENA, Middle East, North Africa. Um, and then the speaking engagements that we've had has reached Norway, US. Wow. Yay. Um, we've been in Europe, so Germany, Portugal, North Africa, the whole region. We've been in Asia. So... It's really stretched mm -hmm. and every year we kind of enter new countries. Mm -hmm. That's very thrilling for us. Right. And yeah. when you started, did you think that you would get here with a day in your vision? Because you did the whole thing by yourself. Yep. From my kitchen. From <laughs> 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 kitchen? Yep. And did you even envision you get, I'm sure you had your dreams and your goals and aspirations, but did you think you would get here where you very clear from the beginning? 
you know so i would like to say yes however there is proof that i wasn't really thinking <laughs> that far because like when i set my visa up told me you can only have two additional on your uh, trade yeah, license yeah. so two additional staff yeah. so that means my in my thinking there was i didn't really see us expanding i didn't really see us mm-hmm. no um I, i mean it's a blessing thank god with god's grace that we're here mm-hmm. and uh Yeah. So do you represent speakers as in the, are any of them on your visa or it's just uh, representation for them? Representation. Yeah. Okay. So the immediate team obviously are, are yes. on the trade license, right. um, but then we represent them. Okay. Yeah. And uh, how do you source these talents or do they just come, come along? Do you have a very, like, do you go, do you see some of their gigs? How do they come about? There are some, so many people out there. Yeah. How do they register with MENA speakers? What is the criteria? Uh, okay. So we, at this stage, we know within a minute if somebody has star quality yeah. or not. Yeah. This is the absolute truth. We can right. see it. And if there's potential to grow as mm-hmm. well. Okay. So both sides. Mm-hmm. Um, we look at people that have three primary things. Okay. One is a story. There is a story there. There is a narrative that makes sense. And when I talk about that, that means... Um, topic you the story that's being told it makes sense okay. uh, it adds value mm-hmm. second one is the way it's being communicated so public speaking skills yes. <laughs> course, yeah. Yeah. if you want to be a public speaker you should have the skills yeah. um and this is both of them are you can create those mm. okay. uh, you can find your story and you can become better at public speaking it's a learned skill yeah. and the third one is you know, your personal brand, your reach, your tribe. Mm. Do you have a tribe? Okay. If you have a tribe, that means that your story has been high impact and people right. are subscribing to what you're saying. People are subscribing, people want to listen to what yeah. it is. And yeah. it's also about aspirations, right? What's your advice for, let's say, I don't just want to say speakers, but in women in general, who've sure. got a dream, sure. they know this is what they have to do, but then they are pulled down by Mostly the inner voices that they sure. can't do it. Or they mm. can't force it. But I don't, mm. What do you think? What, are mm. the, what do you advise to them? Um, so, high performers, mm. um, they tend to get coaches. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. They tend to get support. Mm. Uh, right. Mm. Exactly. Your thinking will take you this far. Mm. But you have somebody with you that's coaching you, mentoring you, is your sponsor... whatever that may be, or all of them, by the yeah. way, <laughs> they're going to help you get further, mm. quicker. Yeah. Mm. And so that, I think, has been instrumental mm. for my career, and I can see it for the women around me. Mm. They're getting that type of strategic support. I'm not only talking about building confidence, but it's, it's a lot of strategy work that needs to be done. Right. And at a certain level of your career, It's not how you do things. I would say it's almost a 50-50 divide. It's how you're performing, mm-hmm. but it's also your interpersonal relationships. Yeah. So how you're communicating, how you're building relationships, how you're managing people. Mm-hmm. And these are what we call soft skills, right. but they're essential, essential skills. skills. Yeah. Exactly. So even in uh, schools and everywhere, I've, I've had a... Use the word, but <laughs> 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 an issue with mm-hmm. schools because um, I've been associated with some schools and everything, and education system in general, like you said, it's soft. It's perceived as a soft skill. Yeah. It's so important. There are so many smart kids, so many uh, smart employees that we have, but it just, they just can't communicate. Yeah. Just losing out so much, right? Yeah. And even the whole educational system. Have you ever been passionate about educational system? Do you ever think that there has to be a lot of changes that has to be done? Because where you from? I think Sweden is one of one of the best education. We we have an excellent educational yeah. system, and it's um, very much. We work a lot with freedom under responsibility. Mm. Freedom under responsibility. So this is direct translation from Swedish. You have the freedom to do essentially whatever you want to do, but you're responsible for the outcomes and delivering what you need to do. Right. Yeah. And so I like that notion of you know, empowering people enough mm. to be adults, to be responsible for their outcomes. Um, if we say in the workplace, you can come and go whenever you would like to, but deliver the results. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
at the set deadline when it comes to education i think education is instrumental in changing people's lives now we come from in sweden education is free and i think that's fantastic um does the education system need to reform yes it hasn't changed in the past hundred years what's great is that you have organizations you know you have like the khan academy and, and guru that are changing the way we're learning. And I know the Ministry of Education here has done a phenomenal job, you kind know, of pushing the envelope yeah. um, in the region and kind of incorporating different methods and modes of learning. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they do. But then it should, all these things should start young, right? Do you believe in that as young as possible? The communication skills, um, the right for kids to be able to speak up when and without being judged, without being put down, because that's something which still happens, traditional educational system, where they don't have the, the right to voice their opinion yeah. most of the times, yeah. which causes a huge impact on the on the child and their growth and them to go forward. It does, right? Sure. So even when I was at university, mm -hmm. I took a weekend course in communication. <laughs> so I think it's such a key skill I keep calling it skill because it is a skill it is, it is. that you can learn and reasonably it should be incorporated earlier on. Yeah. Right. It mo we would benefit being able to well, not only communicate you know, with an audience but mm -hmm. with, a, with another human. Yes. Being able to express yourself mm -hmm. fully and then giving people the, the tools mm -hmm. to be able to express feelings, sentiment, situations. Yes. We're not really educated to do that. This tends to come later on in life. Right. Yeah. Like it's it's almost like um, some, how we say about our physical health versus our mental health because we are more attuned and we've been taught that if we are, you know, if you're sick, you need to go to the doctor. But if you are <laughs> yeah. mentally not feeling well, sure, um, sure, you're not you're not encouraged at all. And it's really it's it all it's all the same thing. Yeah, the whole thing is the same. That yeah. you can't speak up. I mean, one thing's for sure that if you allow, whether that's at school or in the household or outside, if you allow for the expression of thought, if you allow for individuals to be individuals, mm. then you're really creating a safe space. Mm. And this is going to combat things like mental health and like bullying, like yeah. any yes. issues that may arise. So, yes, and I would say it's partly parents' responsibility, teachers' but also as a society to allow for that. Yes. So I make it a point if I'm meeting a kid in like a supermarket, I'll, I'll start asking them questions yeah, <laughs> to see if they're able to express themselves yeah. comfortably. Um, so I try to do that, engage in conversations, see like from their perspective yeah. as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But I, generally speaking, I'm very hopeful for the future and I, I've come across some incredibly savvy students and, oh, and yes. kids. Oh my God. <laughs> changing kids are like kids, adults, everyone. And that's what the world is moving to. Do you see that it's, it's a good thing, it's a bad thing? How do you see the whole technology race against technology? <laughs> so I, I do follow a lot of futurists and, and the way they view the future. Um, one thing is clear, whatever, wherever we are right now, yeah. when it comes to the way the market looks like, the way we're engaging so, socially and whatever it may be, in two, three, four, five years time, within that time frame, it's going to look different. Yeah. True. And so some instrumental skill sets here is agility yeah. to be able to move with that. Mm -hmm and being open to that, mm -hmm. you know. And the second one is to maintain an element of, um, I would say mental health is at the yeah. core of this, yeah. to be okay in an acceptance of the fast pace and the change mm -hmm. that's happening. Yeah. Now, the good news is, okay. I came across this fantastic study okay. from Stanford, and uh, this researcher, Van Sloan, he was looking into what makes popular kids popular. At a high school. Mm. So I asked the same question to uh, a bunch of teenagers. Yeah. And, um, you know, I heard the standard oh, answers. <laughs> that tends to come up as, as an example of what it's people really would assume makes yeah. a person yeah. popular. So beauty, um, smart, if you're smart or not, if you're, you know, athletic or not. Mm. And, and the list goes on. Yeah. So in this research, mm -hmm. he found that the, what makes popular kids popular is the fact that they, on average, smiled more in the corridors. Oh. 
but the list goes on. This, okay, the, okay. the primary point okay. is when they were asked to write down a list of names of people that they liked, their list was longer than the not so popular kids. Mm. Now, this is fantastic. <laughs> so this yeah. tells me if you like people, then people tend to like you back. And so you're creating a space that is welcoming, mm. warm, accepting. Mm. And this, in essence, is, is core for the charisma code. It's core mm. for likability. Because mm. you're allowing everyone's uniqueness right. without judgment. And uh, That's interesting. I wouldn't yeah. have thought that way. Because, I mean, it makes sense. But then I wouldn't have thought that would be the reason. Mm -hmm. But in general, outside world, let's, yeah. let's take out the universities and yeah. schools and everything. But it's your energy that speaks before you even start speaking sure. and you enter a room. It's sure. about the energy of sure. Yeah, I guess in that aspect makes sense. Sure. I mean, we call that the halo effect. Um, yeah. You can call it energy, but it's really some of the nonverbal cues that you're sending. Mm -hmm. So are you coming in with a big smile and open gestures yes. and you're welcoming and you're, you're maintaining eye contact? Right. Or are you walking into the room kind of a bit, uh, you know, you're reluctant? Yeah. Yeah. with that defensiveness yes. and so we make a decision very quickly mm. on whether we find somebody to be trustworthy likable right. safe mm. yeah. right and we're gauging that in every single new interaction that we have mm. and so if you come in and you're signaling with your palm like i'm yeah. here i am your friend yeah. then you're already signaling you know that yeah. we can you build a relationship yeah. And, yeah 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 that's right. So it's, it's very much about our nonverbal cues, mm. the, the energy bit. Right. Yeah, That already, I think, connects even before we start talking and we even have a conversation. Sometimes yeah. deals, are even, uh, deals are made even before, you know, you actually do sit down and talk because you like the person. We, I won't say 100% the deals are done, but at least it would be considered when someone walks in with a very welcoming smile. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, you remember Jerry Maguire, where uh, I think she says, you had me at hello. Hello, yes. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had that as my status for a long time. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> yes. So that absolutely applies. Very quickly, we're, we're gauging how the person we're interacting with and how we perceive them and mm. where, where they're going to fall, kind of. Doesn't mean you can't change. That impression can change. But it becomes slightly more difficult. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And as an economist, going back to the fact that you were an economist <clears> for <throat> how many years? I think. Once an economist, I think always an economist. Always an economist. <laughs> so how have you incorporated that into, you know, Mina speakers and uh, your speaking gigs, speaking engagements? How have you done that? Do you do more like, traditional public speaking gigs? more or mm -hmm. do you also do um, anything to do with financial independence yeah you do mm -hmm. so like a market outlook yeah, yeah I would do that mm -hmm. now the application of economics for the business is more of a practical one okay. an idea of what's happening in the market mm -hmm. where to expand where to invest yes. uh, you know what's interest is what's the rate of inflation mm -hmm. and so all these variables are things that I factor in and, and our strategies moving forward so mm -hmm. this is more where I'm using it mm -hmm. On stage, yeah, absolutely. Mention it, yeah. Right. And um, as a woman, do you believe that financial independence is core, irrespective of whether you're married, whether you're single? You know, for a woman, if you have the purchasing power, you have real influencing power. Yes. Um, and I think there is something incredibly romantic in in choosing, say, a partner on the basis of I'm financially independent, you're financially, but we choose to do this. Right. Um, and so the way of getting wealthy or financially independent, the methods are tried and tested. There is no need to invent the wheel. Mm -hmm. And they're quite standardized. And, and what needs to be done? Yes, invest. Uh, invest in stocks, invest in property, invest in businesses. Do something that yields a return. So that whole process is pretty done. And all you need to do is really, it's a plug and play. Right, you go to the avenues and just do it. Yeah. Irrespective of whether you earn. But my mom, she's, she's been a homemaker all her life. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, it, the, she's made some very wise financial decisions. She's made some investments here and yeah. there. So you don't really have to be the earning factor. Yeah. For family. No. 
yeah but as a woman you do have the power eventually it's always nice to stand on your own right as a woman so what next for Mina speakers right so we're uh, we want to have more great speakers on our books mm-hmm. and we want to keep working with fantastic clients okay. we're expanding uh-huh. <laughs> yes and when you say we're expanding again is it how many, how many team members do you have and how do you function in the different countries so we're expanding from the sense that we're expanding regionally yeah. uh, okay. opening up another regional office Yay. <laughs> it's it's big oh, you know when, when you're a business owner and I know this might sound crazy but just small stuff you know, we go from idea in your mind to printing marketing collateral <laughs> it just feels big and you're like wow this is happening um, yeah so even talking about expanding to a new office and we're going digital as well mm-hmm. So those are the two avenues that we're going um, on. Digital means you will have people just come into your platform and they can get coaching. Is that what digital means? We mean that we're creating a marketplace. Mm-hmm. It's already created. Um, it's called Know Who Market. Okay. <laughs> Where okay. speakers, prospective speakers, aspiring speakers can register themselves. Mm-hmm. And from there, either the team will call them and kind of put them in a speaking engagement or clients can book them directly from the platform. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, so that's, those are the two avenues that we're focusing on at the moment and as a place of growth. Mm-hmm. And we really want to signal to aspiring speakers that if this is what you want to do, these are the things you need. You need a proper headshot, you need testimonials, you need a bio, you need the videos. Mm-hmm. So that sets a standard of what needs to be there. Right. And then for the clients, they get diversity. So they can choose a speaker very quickly with a few clicks and then that's done. Do you see that shift happening? Because there was a time when, let's say at MC, who used to host a show on the television or radio or whatever, they used to be just that. They used to get their MC gigs. But suddenly now, everyone is moving into the... Is that the next natural progression for a... for a speaker, not, not a speaker, for an MC, for instance. Sure. Um, do you think that's the <clears throat> only natural progression? I, I would like to, I mean, I think we've had something to do with that uh, <laughs> movement, uh, however small, but mm. to be the first in the leading Middle Eastern based kind of Arab Speakers Bureau, yes. um, we've invited people to pursue this as a career who didn't necessarily know this was available yeah, sure. so and i think the appetite globally there is space for all of us <laughs> there is space for all of us um okay. and and many more to pursue this yeah mm-hmm. agents so this you know agencies around the world can easily have a couple of thousand speakers on their books wow. yeah and so with the number of events happening here yeah, it's true. it's welcomed yeah. but it's a question of becoming at parity with an international speaker. Now, you MC, right? Yes. And so, you, from a skill set perspective, you know what you need to be there, professional, prepared to really wow an audience. Right. And then before, if a client's going to choose you, you need to have your set of things, sure. like mm-hmm. the testimonials mm-hmm. and the things mentioned, the videos, mm-hmm. headshots, all of that yeah. needs to be in place. So now you're entering space where you're, you know, you're at parity with the international speakers. Yeah. If a client in Norway was asking for it, you'd be able to give them enough documentation to show that you're professional about this. And so we're trying to see that shift happen as well. Mm -hmm. Um, In the beginning, it was a lot of conversations of, I am a speaker. Okay, but what do you have? Yeah, Yeah. no, but I spoke a couple of times. I'm sure you are, but how do we, as a third party, talk to a client and show them that? Mm -hmm. And so it's about... Bringing up you know, the yeah. standards so that we are competing with the international speakers agencies right. around the world and we're at parity with that standard. My biggest wish and dream is to export as many Middle Eastern voices to the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing vision and the fact that you know you've grown like you said, from your kitchen to two offices now. <laughs> and just three years, it's been amazing. And um, you are someone that many people do look up to wow. in UAE for what you've achieved. And um, 
like you just mentioned, you just mentioned it casually, but that is actually the truth. You have a lot to do with that changing aspect of public speaking in UAE, in the region. You do, Mina wow. Speakers is someone who's made that revolutionary change here and it's all you. <laughs> and it's been an absolute pleasure having you here thank with you us for having me Arabia and bringing your story to the world so that was Sana Adam and she is the founder and CEO of the leading speaking agency Mina Speakers in the region so follow her how do we say follow you on Instagram yes very much so <laughs> so follow her she's very inspirational she's got a great story to say and um, be inspired thank you thank you thank you